I wondered why Mike was lowering the lectern right now. So, um, here is our summary statement from Paul. Next slide. Christ in ye, the hope of glory. Our first question in this second session is essentially, who is this Jesus who powerfully indwells believers? Tomorrow we'll think about the you. So come back tomorrow. Paul's stunning answer to this who question is the surprising and unexpected idea that Jesus is both the cosmic Christ and the crushed Christ. <coughs> Jesus is both the undisputed Lord who was yet humiliated and crucified. He is paradoxically the ultimate king who won by losing. So let's open up these verses that we read. I want to open it up by thinking about the idea of gaps. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this phrase. Sometimes in discussions about theology, you might hear the phrase, the God of the gaps. No one really seems to know where this phrase originates. I, I think it's probably used now mostly by atheistic critics of Christianity to express the idea that people only believe in God because there are things they don't understand. So the suggestion is that as scientific knowledge increases and philosophic, philosophical understanding grows, the gaps get smaller and eventually there'll be no reason left for anyone to believe in God. You get that idea. I start there because when I, when I began swimming around in Colossians, I, I was quite shocked to find that in the first century, people thought exactly the opposite to the way modern atheists do. So, let's, let's start. If you were trying to make sense of life in the first century, I think one of the starting points would have been the reality that the physical world is messed up. I think that's a starting point, perhaps us as well. I suppose this is not very different to any other period in history. Life is hard. People die. Wars happen. Disasters occur. There's pain and sadness sometimes. Relationships break down. It isn't hard to grasp that this physical world is wonderful, but somehow also very broken. But it seems that the primary way that thinkers and philosophers in that ancient world in the first century dealt with this was not to deny the transcendent. They believed that there was some kind of God, whoever he was, but they all seemed to agree that whoever God was, he must surely be too high and too distant to have got his hands messy with this broken world. If the physical world is broken and God is somehow good, there must be a great gap between the two. That's very different, isn't it? So instead of them putting a slowly shrinking God into an ever-reducing gap, their instinct actually was to take God out of the gap and drive him very far away. Their tendency was almost to protect God from having to get his hands dirty. Does that make sense? This led to, to all kinds of c conclusions and commentators and theologians have debated this in relation to Colossians specifically. To, I, I think to their way of thinking, the, the, the seed of it is that God must somehow, that the great God who's transcendent must have somehow delegated making this world to lesser beings who somehow made a mess of it. So what they put into this gap was a fusion and a hodgepodge of all kinds of religious ideas. And, and their ultimate spiritual purpose became, in, in life, 
was to try to find a way to placate all the dodgy, incompetent middlemen that they put in the middle to get enlightenment and find the God who was above all of this gap. They were looking for ultimate spiritual fulfillment. They were looking to find this mysterious, transcendent God. So here's a question for you. What would you put in this gap? What I'm trying to portray here is a kind of tension, a transcendent God and a broken world. Supreme creator and finite creatures, how do you bridge that gap? What can you put in there to reconcile these two extremes in a satisfactory manner? And you know, it is one thing to bridge it in theory, philosophically, but the real question is, how do you bridge this personally in your own life? Isn't it true that so often our own lives seem to be this messy mixture of yearning for what is ultimate, satisfying, meaningful, and the painful, disappointing reality of much of our experiences. For us, this is not a little gap that's getting smaller. Sometimes in life, our experiences mean that this is a huge, yawning gap. Paul's central idea in this letter is that the stunning and sufficient answer to this question is not so much philosophical as personal. The answer to this puzzle is not a clever insight, but a living person. And the unique one who bridges these extremes that would otherwise be impossible to reconcile is Jesus. According to Paul, Jesus is the ultimate resolution of the tension at the heart of the universe and the tension that we experience so often in our own lives. He is unconquerably high and yet stooped so unbelievably low. And it's precisely this fact that makes him so utterly unique and so compellingly attractive. So, I hope that makes sense. It did in my head anyway. Let's trace something of Paul's logic here by just looking for a few moments at these verses that uh, we read together. I want to do that under three headings and then we'll draw some conclusions. So here's the first one. Christ is the image of the invisible God. The word image there conveys something of representation or reflection or likeness. Paul is saying that the God who would otherwise be invisible and high over all is made visible in the person of Jesus. Jesus Christ is the unique person who bridges the gap between the invisible God and his visible creation. So this is a word that speaks of revelation, God revealing himself to us. If we want to know what God is like, we can see completely what he's like in the person of Jesus Christ. I want to underline for you here that Paul is making a clear contrast here between human wisdom that is always climbing and searching and yearning and guessing even and God's own revelation of himself, his self-disclosure in the person of Jesus. So you, you now know that um, I run a business and a few, three or four years ago, we experienced a fairly traumatic cyber attack in which all of our data was corrupted by hackers 
And when we tried to open files, a message popped up on the screen, call us on this number so that you can pay the ransom. It was, it was just horrible. And the, the main reason it was horrible, what, one of my jobs these days is more the finance, our, our accounts were all encrypted. So we had, we had no accounts. So one of my jobs was to lead our back office team in rebuilding a new accounting system. We had to go back to the beginning of the financial year and forensically rebuild the accounts by re-inputting. It, it, was, it took us three months to rebuild the system. The, this, idea, this idea of building something from the ground up is a good analogy of how human philosophy operates in trying to find meaning and coherence. But Paul here is not saying that he has built something from the ground up and somehow journeyed upwards, climbed the ladder to enlightenment. What he's telling us is that God has actually traveled downwards. How amazing is that? We, have, we don't need to climb up the ladder and guess. God has come down the ladder in the person of Jesus and revealed himself. It isn't that Paul is anti-reason or anti-philosophy. He was actually, as it happens, a very well-educated, rational man. It is just that his human reason and philosophy on their own had not been able to discover by itself the ultimate reality that is revealed by God in the person of Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God. Apparently the idea of image here is also a Jewish one that relates to wisdom. In Jewish thought, the invisible God makes himself known through his wise acts. In other words, you can know what, you can know what God is like by, what, by his actions. Paul builds on this idea here to say that the true wisdom of God has actually been all wrapped up in a living person and become visible in Jesus. Paul says this explicitly in chapter 2 and verse 3 when he talks about Jesus, namely Christ, in whom are hidden, what? All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Like an ambassador who embodies the values of an organization, Jesus is the image of God. Secondly, Christ is the creator and sustainer of all reality. Let's speed up a little as we pick out some of the key phrases in these next verse, few verses. First of all, in verse 15, Paul uses the word firstborn. Paul doesn't mean there that Jesus was the first created being. This goes back to the idea in the ancient world of the firstborn son being superior to the younger siblings. It's a statement of preeminence. Um, the firstborn son was the head over the, the family, the one who would inherit and so Jesus is described here by Paul in that vein as the first, he, he's, he, he's the preeminent head over all things. And Jesus can't be a created being anyway, because in the very next verse, Paul says that by Jesus, all things were created. Jesus created, Paul says, every single other power and authority. In verse 16, whether visible or invisible, in heaven or on earth, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. Whatever powers there are in this world, or even in the invisible spiritual world, they're all subordinate to him. There is no power that exists that has any power over him. Nothing phases him. No one can back him into a corner. Nothing will ever dethrone him. He isn't absent. 
His hands aren't tied. There is nothing or no one that is answerable or afraid, to, answerable to him or that he is afraid of. There's no power of evil that has ever been that could overpower him. It's the FA Cup final today. And sometimes we talk about defenders having attackers in their back pocket. I can tell you that this Jesus has all things in his back pocket. Nothing phases him. No one will get past him. Furthermore, Paul says at the beginning of verse 17, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. This is another big idea in the ancient world. It's a bit Star Wars this shit. I think people believe that there was some kind of life principle, a kind of rationality, a cohesive force, may the force be with you, that pervaded all things and bonded the universe together somehow. Paul is saying that that glue is Jesus. That glue is personal. It's not a force. It's him. It's not, it's not just glue. It's living glue. If the universe was a body, Christ would kind of be its soul or spirit. Everything would regress into being a corpse if it wasn't for his life-giving animation. He is the hand that animates the glove. He is the sustainer of all things. Without Christ, all reality would disintegrate. He is not the God of the gaps in the sense of explaining things that science can't explain. He's the one who invented the science. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Now, of course, this is where we have a problem. This is where the first century world, in its wisdom, would have a problem. This whole poetic tribute to Jesus here is glorious, but it has to face up to the fact that the world that we experience is broken. If Christ is supreme, why is there disharmony and dysfunctionality? I want to suggest that Paul doesn't just anticipate this, it's actually the climax that he's building to in this passage. So thirdly, Christ is the recreator and reconciler of all brokenness. What becomes clearer here is that this great gulf, this great gap, the tension that we talked about is actually a dislocation, a rupture. It is as if evil has arisen within God's good creation and like a centrifugal force, things have begun to spiral out of control and break up. There is a surprise here at the beginning of verse 18. Paul next writes that Christ is the head of the body, the church. I think that is very striking indeed that at this very point when Paul's about to explode and his pen's about to melt because he's going so cosmic that he comes back down to earth with a bump and mentions the church. And actually, if you, if you read this and missed out the two words, the church, it would all still work. This whole paragraph would still make sense. You would still think that Paul was talking about the universe. But Paul does add the words, the church. In other words, in the same way that Jesus is the life animating the glove of the cosmos, he is also the life-giving creative agency that makes the church alive. Paul says he is the beginning, i.e. the new beginning, and the firstborn from among the dead. Again, this is implying that he is the senior one, the primary one, the preeminent one, but this time it is the beginning of a new creation that starts with his own universe-altering resurrection. 
Isn't it striking that Paul says here at this point, so that in everything he might have the supremacy? Surely Christ would be supreme just because he made and sustains all things. But no, Paul says that Christ is, if it were possible, even more supreme than we think he is, because having been broken himself, he rose again, showing that the brokenness is not the final word, and that he can put together what has been broken. This means that while God is high over all, he is not so distant that he never get his hands dirty. In Jesus, God has rolled up his sleeves and entered the fray. The high and transcendent one comes into the brokenness. In fact, he himself is broken in order to redeem and mend the brokenness. And please don't miss the note of divine happiness here. Don't miss the pleasure. What does Paul say in verse 19? For God was pleased. What would make God happy? Don't miss the divine happiness here. What on earth could you give to an infinite God to make him thrilled? But this tooth somehow makes God excited. This tooth makes God himself swell with pleasure and delight. God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Christ. You'll know, perhaps, that this kind of language has echoes about of the, of the, New Test, the, the Old Testament, sorry, dwelling, dwelling. We're told that God was pleased to come and live in a temple in the midst of his people. But here God doesn't come temporarily to a building to be near his people, the infinite God in all his fullness, all his wisdom, all his power, love and glory takes up permanent residence in Christ and this is the Christ who begins the job of putting all things back together for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things Paul is getting to the heart of things now this great king came to die on a cross for our sins. He has un united his divine nature to our human nature. Ultimate glory has been forever wedded to sheer brokenness. And when you and I are united to this Christ by faith, all of his glory becomes ours forever and all of our failure is swallowed up by him forever God treats him as if he had committed all of our sin that's why he was broken so that he can treat us as if we had lived his perfect life that is why we have hope Christ in you the hope of glory let me just make some brief observations and then we'll draw a word picture as we close. First of all, the supremacy of Christ means that he is totally sufficient. It, we said it already. It ought to be clear that the Christ Paul presents here in this passage is not one among many, is it? That this Jesus is utterly unique. That this is not like choosing toothpaste in the aisle of the supermarket. He, he's in an aisle all of his own over here. He is the only one, the unique one, who bridges this great gulf between the invisible God and his vandalized creation. There is, therefore, 
no need for any other knowledge or wisdom or person to mediate that gap between God and us. You and I don't need Jesus plus someone else. If he is the great ruler who holds the cosmos together from its beginning to its end, is he not able to sustain even the feeblest believer and bring them whole to ultimate glory? One writer puts it like this. Possessing preeminent authority, Christ must be a perfect saviour. Possessing preeminent authority, Christ must be a perfect saviour. Secondly, the brokenness of Christ means that he is, of course, profoundly sympathetic. The innocent one suffered. The infinitely high one went infinitely low. The one who created all things lost everything. The all-powerful one was so weak that he couldn't even carry his own cross. The sovereign king was humiliated and led out to die. The author and giver of life was laid out in a stone-cold tomb. He bears our human sin and shame to bring us forgiveness, but he also knows the full depth of human anguish. He's not aloof or distant or cold, but clothed with our human flesh. Do you know that there is a man in heaven right now? I, I didn't know, I'm not a musician, I didn't know this, but did you, did you know that when you kind of press a key on a piano and the string vibrates, if there's another piano nearby, the same string will resonate with the first one. Jesus, a man in heaven who feels, resonates with the things we feel. It's, it's glorious. But thirdly, it is the unity of Christ that makes him so utterly attractive. So what I mean by this is that there's only one Christ. You can't divide him up into separate parts. He's not confused. There's not a powerful Christ and a broken Christ. It's the blend of attributes in him that makes him so unique, desirable, and beautiful, and praiseworthy. He is strong without being exploitative. He's kind without being weak. He is truth and love and clarity and compassion and power and grace and tough and tender. If Jesus was a tune, he would be the most indescribably beautiful harmony. Now here is the weird picture and it isn't mine. You don't need to turn to it. But in chapter 4 of the book of Revelation, we get an amazing vision of the throne room of the universe with the sovereign God seated on his eternal throne, receiving the worship and adoration of his creatures. But in chapter 5, we're told that he has a scroll in his hand. It has writing on both sides and it's sealed. I think this represents the whole of history. All the days that God has ordained are written there in the scroll. And then a mighty angel steps forward and in a loud voice that thunders into every nook and cranny of the universe, cries out, who is worthy to open the scroll, to break the seals? This, of course, is a question of who is competent and capable to hold all of human history in their hands. Who can unlock it? Who can oversee it? Who can hold it all together? And in heaven, there's complete silence. There's no one 
No creature anywhere who is noble enough, mighty enough, worthy enough, good enough, capable enough. And John, seeing this vision, falls on his face weeping. Surely there's someone. If there isn't, we're lost. And as he weeps on the floor, one of the elders touches John on the shoulder and says, Stop crying. Look, here is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He has triumphed. But as John looks through his tears for this great roaring lion, what does he see? What does he see? He sees a lamb looking as if it had just been killed. You couldn't draw it. How can you be a roaring lion? and a bleeding lamb at the same time. The cosmic Christ is the crucified Savior. Jesus is the true God of the gaps who bridges divine glory and human fallenness. And in an ultimate sense, despite our pain and sin, this broken world is actually in safe hands the nail scarred hands of the lion who is the lamb i I don't know all of you i know some of you if if you are not yet a believer in jesus this is the amazing christ who seeks you not to oppress you or to exploit you, but to save you and empower you to be the best you. And if you are a believer in Jesus, this is the beautiful Christ who indwells you. All sufficient Lord, sympathetic friend, Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is enough. This is the breathtaking and unexpected Christ that we face the world with. The great king who won by losing. We're going to sing. So maybe our musicians can come up. Let's bow for a moment, shall we? And we'll pray as they do that. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for your word. We're so thankful for this magnificent chapter. We're so thankful that you point us beyond ourselves, outside of ourselves, to see the glory and beauty of Jesus. Father, we pray that that would refresh us and energize us and inspire us and comfort us We pray that it would assuage our fears. And we pray that you would bless us now as we lift our voices in praise to him, the cosmic Christ who was crushed. We pray in his good name. Amen.